talked about how all the reactions are related to each other in terms of stability. And so this week, what we're going to do, at least today, we're going to look at um, mechanisms. Okay. And we already talked a little bit about mechanisms. Um, but I just wanted to show you a couple because there's certain characteristics in the mechanisms that are the same for all of these reactions. So um, this is the reactions of acyl halides. And they're probably the easiest one to draw the mechanism for. The one addition to this slide I realize is it should have this on it too. So carboxylate ions and carboxylic acids can react with anhydrides. Uh, carboxylates are, are the easiest ones to do really. And then we'll do like water or something. But if you have a, a carboxylate ion and an anhydride, the mechanism basically just goes like this. So I'm going to go like this. So you have that, right? And then it attacks. Remember, this is the partially positive side. This is a partial, partially negative side like that. So the oxygen of the carboxylic acid is going to attack. And then what you end up with is an intermediate. I'm going to call this R. I'll call it R1 because I already have an R on the page. And I'll have this. I didn't quite leave myself enough room for this, but it looks something like that. And then you, your lone pairs are now up here. All right, you still have two lone pairs on the oxygen. And then it, it's just a matter of what's the better leaving group. So this would be considered a tetrahedral intermediate right here. This is my tetrahedral intermediate at the bottom of the slide. Oh yeah, I should practice doing this at the bottom of the slide. And then what happens is this is a better leaving group than this. And so what happens when this collapses, right? The collapsing kicks out the chloride ion. Now, why does it collapse, right? Because this intermediate has more strain than it does when it's flat. In the tetrahedral intermediate, the groups are closer together. So we have steric strain some of the stuff we talked about last time. So it collapses and then you form this. I have R1 here and R over here and then I have CL minus. So pretty straightforward, I think. So in this chapter, there's a lot of collapse. Yeah, there's a lot of attacking and then a lot of leaving. Sort of like the Vikings. Actually, the Vikings attacked and stayed. It's kind of a misconception. But Viking, well, I don't know why I said that, but anyways, yeah, <laughs> it's true. Now, okay, um, the, the more difficult mechanism is when you use something like water. So actually, I'm going to take this, this, what I wrote here, and I'm going to do the mechanism with water. So I'm going to write water out like this, even though it looks kind of weird. Right, and so the water is going to come in and attack. And again, this doesn't have a steric strain on it, and it's also flat, so it's easy to attack. And we talked about the size of the orbital and the charge on the carbon. We talked about all that stuff last week. So it's going to go like this. And then what you're going to end up with is this. I'm going to put it at the bottom. And here's, here's what they generally say you have to do is you have to deprotonate this oxygen because if you don't, then when this collapses, this is actually what leaves. All right. So you deprotonate this with another water and you'll end up with something like this. Oh, sorry. No collapsing yet. So what does that is just a base. Okay. So I, in this system, it's probably water. 
it'll kick that back off. I know it's a little bit small, but look at it. I don't know if I can zoom in on that for you or not. Yeah, it doesn't let me zoom. Uh, yeah, kicks it off. And then you end up with this, and now this can collapse. So this, if you notice, this guy looks just like this guy. You're getting to the same point in the mechanism where you have a good leaving group in here for the chloride. Oh, shoot. The good leaving group in here, the chloride. It's not letting me do that. Yeah, the chloride. All right. You have the good leaving group here, chloride. Here you have the neutral oxygen. And over here you have a neutral oxygen. So when this thing collapses, the Cl will come off instead of the OH minus because that's a bad leaving group. So this collapses and this leaves. And so you end up with the carboxylic acid. And she was the acid too. This is turning the oxygen to alcohol. Uh, you don't need to in this case because it's a fast reaction already. Uh, you have good leaving groups. Uh, but you could, I mean, I don't know that it helps that much. So. I've actually ne never seen that. All right. But when you get down to... Uh, see what else is there. Oh yeah, so looking at this list then, if it's a negative ion coming in, you don't have to do any like deprotonation steps, but all of these will be a deprotonation step as you go towards the product. Because every time you have this neutral, right, it's got a lone pair on it, every time it plugs itself in here, or here, sorry, here, there we go, here, you end up with this positive charge, you gotta get rid of that. All right. So these are all the different kinds of products you get. Now, when you do it with uh, an amine, right, and you put this thing in here, in the mechanism, you need a base. And so you'll notice that the way I've written it is that you have to have two equivalents of ammonia because one of the ammonias acts as a base. And as soon as it's protonated, it's not nucleophilic. So in other words, you're gonna go through that first step of the mechanism. You're gonna end up with this. Right, like this. And then you're gonna need a base to pull one of these hydrogens off down here. And since you're using a base in the reaction, one equivalent to the base will just go to neutral. The other way people do it is they'll use a, a solvent that's basic. So pyridine has this lone pair on it. It's a good basic solvent, right? Non-nucleophilic because the nitrogen has big shoulders on it basically. And so as the result is you can do one equivalent of ammonia as long as you have something like pyridine as your solvent. So I'm gonna say R. C O O H also here. And you should be like, this is like a general, like a test question. Propose a specific mechanism, right, for one of the following reactions. So I'll give you a reaction, and you have to tell me what, you have to draw the mechanism out for the reaction I showed. You also have to be able to predict the product. So in any of these, right, all you need to do to predict the product is remove a hydrogen and attach it in general. Okay. I don't have my slide advancer in. So I have to do that. So the hydrides is the second most reactive. We talked about why it's not as reactive as acyl halides. Remember that was Gus. Gus is dating two girls. Right? Yeah, it leaves them kind of busy. Can't pay attention to both of them at the same time. And so he ends up being not as reactive. Right? But all the same, you'll notice it reacts with carboxylates and also you can put carboxylic acids in there as well. And what you get out of it is you get a different anhydride out. So a carboxylate, and then I have it listed out like on the next slide. Let me disconnect this thing and plug this thing in. Gotten used to not having to go to the computer. Right, if you use a, um, sorry, where is it at? Yeah, you, well, I don't have it there. I need to put one more in here. Let's go like this. I thought it was there. It's not. 
and we'll call that R1. Then what you'll end up with is this. Like that. And, and the name for these, I mean, is the general name. They call them mixed anhydrides. They just have different carboxylic acid groups. Mechanism, same thing. This is this is a repeat mechanism, like we go to here. It's a repeat of what we did here. You make a tetrahedral intermediate, okay? And let's look at how it actually works out. So we'll do one of these over here. Um, yeah, what do we want to do? On the right. No, um, on the last slide. One more. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, the first, the one you, the one that you drew the last. Oh, one. this one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the LH, what did it attack the R group? Yeah. So, that? so this will attack either one of these. Okay. Right. Yeah. Because it's symmetric, it doesn't matter, and you'll end up with this as one product, and the other product will be the other end as a carboxylic acid. Oh, so yeah. So, so you're going to end up with one of these. And that's why I show down here, there's one of these. Like if you use an alcohol, all right, the alcohol is going to protonate, all right, be pro. So the alcohol, is, let's just run that mechanism real quick. I'll run it to the one on the left. It doesn't really matter. This. So that's going to go like that. These get to be a little bit of a pain to draw. Here's the mechanism, though. So you're going to end up with R and you're going to have oxygen with a negative charge on it. You have an oxygen with a hydrogen and an R group. And then you have the other side of the anhydride. So you have O and then C, double bond O and R like that. And this has a positive charge. So, so if this collapses now, the way it's written with the lone pair coming in, this is what's gonna leave. This is a better leaving group, All right? So, so what ends up happening is you have to, again, you have to deprotonate I'm going to say minus H plus. You'll see this a lot. I want you to always draw like a base coming in and then kicking electrons back. But you'll see this a lot. And, and they're assuming you know that there's a base and it takes the hydrogen off. And there's a lot of things that could be the base in the solution, so they just don't specify like exactly what it is. So you're going to end up with this. Basically, your anhydride is intact on the right hand side and the left hand side right now I've like modified. Oh, yeah. So there, uh, hmm. yeah, I don't know what happened here, but you know, there's an yeah, R group right. over here. Yeah. I spend time almost every other week adjusting it and pushing it back and then making, changing the, I don't know, I think vibration in the hood or something makes it change. I don't get this projector very well. It doesn't, not my friend. All right, so now, once you're at this point, this can go like that, and you can kick this guy out, and then you'll end up with your product. Oops, end up with your product. R, C, double bond, O, and then O and R. Plus, R, C, O, O. Actually, minus in this case. So no matter what, there's always a carboxylate. Yeah, there's always an in anhydride, there's just going to always be a carboxylate or a carboxylic acid on the other side. But again, all these mechanisms run and look the same. You just have to practice them just so you're familiar with them. Always know that if, and, and this is one of the things I'll talk about, if, if you have an acid catalyst, we haven't done one yet, but if you have an acid catalyst, you always protonate, it's the first step. But always in the tetrahedral intermediate, if you have a protonated form, you deprotonate it. So we're about to get to the ones that need a catalyst. Um, it's the reactions of esters. And there's a lot more notes on this one. Um, the leaving group in an ester, so an ester, right, looks like this. I'll draw it. Okay. 
and I'll call that one, and I'll just make this, this is R. O, R, right, or R, O minus is a strong base, it's a bad leaving group. So these are ones for sure that are really slow unless you had a catalyst, because you have a bad leaving group. So what you're gonna want to do in order to get it to come off is you're gonna have to propane, right, to get that oxygen to come off. Because you don't want it to leave like this, so you need to protonate to give you this as leaving group. Now it turns out uh, in esters, uh, you can catalyze uh, hydrolysis by using an acid catalyst or you can use a base catalyst. And base catalyst mechanism is a little bit different, but we'll show that, we'll, I'm gonna show you both. But what you're gonna do with a, with a uh, ester typically is you can either form another ester, it's called transesterification, which means I take one ester and replace the alcohol functional group with a different one. And these esters, we use them a lot because they're fragrances and they're all kinds of stuff. So if you want to change it, that's one of the ways that you do it. Um, the, the, yeah, the word for it is alcoholysis. I always like that one. Because like hydrolysis, you split water, you're splitting alcohol, but it just sounds so much funnier than hydrolysis. Right? And then when you do water, right, that's when you're just trying to get back to the carboxylic acid and remove the alcohol functional group. So when you add water to it, you end up with a carboxylic acid. Right? And you can also do it with an amine. Amines will react. So this is called aminolysis because you're just going to take an amine and you're going to split it and add it to the add it to the carboxylic acid function of group. Um, the only exception to the ester is where the leaving group is actually pretty good. It's these, right? This is phenoxide ion. Phenoxide ion comes from phenol. Any of these uh, aromatic alcohols tend to be relatively good leaving groups because of resonance and aromaticity. All right. So we're going to do a mechanism for one of these. Actually, we're going to do couple of them, one of which I don't see up here, so I'll fix that. Um, let's do, let's do this one up here. Do the amine one. <laughs> All right, we'll do the amine one. That's one of the ones I was going to do. Yeah, oh, and I'm going to put H plus on this one. You can't do H plus on this one. Uh, simply because when you do H plus in here, it's going to end up protonating the amine. And when the amine becomes protonated, it can't be a nucleophile. The, the lone pair will be capped off and won't be able to attack. So we're going to start with an ester. And we're going to start with uh, ammonia for the example. Now this, uh, because you can't use an acid to catalyze this, this reaction's slow. So the nitrogen's gonna attack, right? And I'll open up like this. Erasing the whole thing. And I'll end up with, I'll write it out like this. All right. What do you have to do next? Well, if it collapses now, right, this is going to leak. Exactly. So you have to remove a hydrogen, all right? So we're going to remove a hydrogen and you're going to have a base. Typically the base in this is the ammonia or a pyridine if you use it as a solvent, right? So it's just like we showed with amines before or nitrogens before, you're gonna have the same kind of thing. So now I have a, a base, comes in, kicks a pair of electrons back.
and then you have something that looks like that. Uh, I didn't draw all the lone pairs on you. If you want to, you can draw all the lone pairs. On. And now when this thing collapses, it's going to kick this guy out to kick the alcohol functional group out. Because because this is that's the better leaving group. The NaH two minus is like by far the worst leaving group. So when this thing collapses like this, this group gets kicked out. And so you'll end up with an amide, an R. I left the R out a couple of these. You can add those back in. Like that. So this base is protonated. We'll probably get together with this and we'll probably exchange. You'll end up back with the amine back and you'll end up with the carboxy. So for the base, just for like an H2 or something? Or yeah, it's probably another NH2. Depends on, again, B for, uh, ha, ha, ha. B, wait a minute. Huh. Yeah, well, I thought I wrote the B, but I guess it's B. Most likely NH3, uh, but if you use pyridine as the solvent, it could be pyridine. And then if you use NH3, then you probably need to add an extra equivalent just to make sure it reacts. And like I said, this reaction is a little bit slow because you can't really do an acid catalyst for it. Um, let's see. The out, you know what? Uh, I think that kind of covers it because if you do the alcohol, right, reacting with the alcohol, you're still going to have a protonation here. This will just be an O. It'll be an R on it. You got to deprotonate and then move on. If you do uh, water, right, this will be an O with two hydrogens and a positive charge. You have to deprotonate and move on. All right. So if you're going to do transesterification, right, um, typically that's done with an acid uh, catalyst because doing this, right, this is not a good nucleophile. And so what you need to do to make this a better reaction is to actually protonate this oxygen so the reaction goes faster. You can do it like this, but it's going to be slow. So, so this is like the uncatalyzed version. Right? Um, but you, basically, this is going to be slow. So you can increase the reaction rate by stabilizing the intermediate and by stabilizing the leaving group. So this is from your book. I think I stole this from you. Here's the ester, all right? You do a proton. So if you're looking at mechanism, the thing they don't draw here, this goes like this. So this positive charge makes the, the carbon more, electro uh, more electrophilic. And that's how it picks up the reaction rate. That's why it gets faster when you do that. So then the oxygen from the water can come in and it attacks and then you end up with this. So the leaving group still like you can depro you have to deprotonate this otherwise if it collapses, that's the thing that leaves, right? So there's a deprotonation step. Again, there's a base involved that sort of kicks that back. And so like I said, you see this all the time. Going in this direction, you remove a hydrogen. Going in that direction, you add a hydrogen. I'll, I'll tell you why they have arrows going both ways in a second. So now you have this, right? And then this is still a bad leaving group. So under a conditions where you have an acid catalyst, what happens is this gets protonated. 
and then it becomes a good leaving group. Okay. So again, like that, that's what gives you this intermediate, which when it collapses, gives you a protonated product. And this PKA, by the way, these carboxylic acids, when they're protonated, their PKAs are like uh, pretty far negative, if I remember so right, like H below plus, minus two. Would the H plus just be like, like uh, water or something, or be like massive? the H plus is the H pluses? H pluses? Yeah. Oh, usually it's a little sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid. Yeah, and, and, and then you have your, you're going in this direction, you, you have uh, water, right? So when you add the sulfuric acid, the water produces hydronium. So the H plus source is really hydronium. Okay. Yeah, so it's like, you know, H2SO4, H2O, H, H3O plus. This is like the step that happens before an HSO4 minus. So this is actually these guys. Right, it's the, the guy on top. Feel like this. That's who that is. When you're in the alcohol situation, uh, if you have an alcohol, and I'm going to talk about that in a second, you're going to be going in this direction. That's why there's arrows in both directions. Um, then what you're doing is you're protonating the alcohol to make the equivalent of hydronium with the alcohol, a protonated uh, alcohol molecule. Okay, so all right. So what else is there here? Yeah, and so um, base, right? Kicks that off, put the electrons back, and then you end up down here as your product. This is your quote unquote product, right? So here's the deal. This, if you look at the leaving group for both of these, like this is the leaving group, right? And then you have this, that's also a leaving a group in a sense. Like if you're going in reverse. So if you're going this way and you form the ester from a carboxylic acid, you, can, you have to go backwards through this entire mechanism and you'll end up with this as your leaving group. That leaving group and that leaving group, the water and the alcohol have the same PKAs. They're very similar, right? So this reaction, if you don't do anything special, right? And you have, one mole of this and one mole of this and one mole of this and one mole of this, it'll sit at equal concentrations for the whole. It, it doesn't progress either to the, to the forward direction or the reverse direction. The way you make an ester is by adding more water and removing product. So this is the way you make this reaction progress in either direction. It's just using Le Chatelier's principle. You force it to make one or the other. Okay. Yeah, so this is for the hydrolysis of the ester. This is going the other way. This is for the formation of the ester. So let me draw those arrows like this. This is hydrolysis. And this is for esterification. And Fisher was the guy who came up with this scheme, so that's why it gets named as a Fisher esterification. Like Fisher diagrams, when you learn the stereochemistry stuff, he did a lot of this real early work. The two tetrahedral intermediates have names, tetrahedral intermediate one and tetrahedral intermediate two. It's important to kind of know what those are, but if you're running the reaction in reverse, they switch. Like this is the first one, and that's the second one. That's all it means, and the direction you're traveling is that's the first one you come across, and then there's the second one. Okay. So be able to do this one. Like, you know, when I give you the list, oh, here's mechanisms. Be able to do this mechanism. It's usually one of the ones on the list. Um, and then I might, if I give you the mechanism, I'll ask you questions like, right, what's the base? in the mechanism. And there's a bunch of things that could be listed. If you're going in this direction, it's water. If you're going in this direction, it's probably alcohol. Because it's what you have in excess, which acts as the base. So if you want to make the ester, this is what will be in excess. If you want to do the hydrolysis, this will, it will be what's in excess. And you'll push it one way or the other. All right.
Yeah, so, um, yeah, I wrote all over that, sorry. Um, I'll go back, because it's horrible. You'll notice this is acid catalyzed, right? There are no negatively charged species when you do acid catalysis, because you're protonating everything. When you do base catalysis, there's no positive charges. It's always negative or neutral you're always removing protons from things and making negative charges. So one of the things to remember when you're doing these mechanisms is check when you're done. Like, did I make a negative charge even doing acid catalyst? Then you know you like you follow the step from a different mechanism. Okay. Just things to help you get along with the writing of these. Uh, the only one that does something different, and I'll just walk you through this. There are quaternary uh, I'm oh, sorry, not quaternary, uh, tertiary carbons. When you have a tertiary carbon, it turns out the carbocation, we talk about carbocation stability, it's stable enough that it just snaps off, all right? So nucleophile, right, you protonate, and then you get to this, and then what happens is, oh, wait, there's a positive charge missing? No, no, it's okay. I, I skipped a step, though. Uh, I did skip a step. Yeah, that should be positive and then it would Because it doesn't, it shouldn't be positive, but there's a step missing in between here. Let me draw it. I don't quite know even what it looks like, but I gotta, I'm just gonna do it. Yeah, the, the intermediate that's missing is this one. I'll see if I can fit it in there. I drew that weird. Oh, well, anyways. That's the one that's missing. That's what that actually forms. And then what happens is this bond snaps off like that and it kicks those back. And that's, that's actually uh, how you get down to, uh, let's see, here. Okay. So it's not quite drawn, right? I guess I've never noticed that. Huh. And then this, because it's a carbocation generally unstable, will pick up whatever the solvent is. So if you're doing hydrolysis, we'll pick that up. If it's in water. So the double bond goes to the Yeah, so so when this snaps right here, right, and goes to here, that becomes the carbonyl function. Yeah. And then so that's what that is. But then this just neutralizes that, right? Yeah, so you end up with a lone pair here that was a bond up here. Yeah, so then now you have, this is the hydrolysis product, then the rest of this is just what happens to this carbocation. Well, it can't just stay like that, so it picks up a water molecule in the hydrolysis reaction. Um, yeah, but it, this happens just because the carbocation is more stable. It turns out to be faster than a regular hydrolysis reaction. All right, next, this is the other one. So, um, base, they say it's, okay, they'll say, you'll, okay, you hear it called base catalyzed, um, but it turns out in this reaction, if I'm not mistaken, the last time I did the counting, this oxygen gets used up. So it's not really a catalysis reaction, it's, because, you know, cat catalysis, you regenerate the hydroxide if it's catalysis. So it ends up, you'll hear it calling it catalysis. It's really just, this makes it faster react. So let's say promoted, okay? Uh, uh, technicality with the words. But same thing, watch. So this, this attacks, right? Good nucleophile now. It attacks, forms this. Then this collapses, and then the CH3O is removed. Now, this is a good nucleophile, and it's, pKa for like water again would be like 15. And this has the same, same pKa. So you would think like this would be like a one-to-one -one equilibrium. The pKa's are the same, but you would have just as much of the reactant as you do of the product at the equilibrium, the reaction. But here's the problem. You form a carboxylic acid and you form a base and they neutralize each other. So this is straight acid base. And when you neutralize it, you remove it from the equilibrium. So what does that do to the equilibrium? Like Le Chatelier's principle just drags it all the way to the right. So base hydrolysis is actually very, very fast and yields almost 100% product. Okay. Um, 
this is actually a problem. Like, do you guys remember uh, making the banana one? Yeah. yeah, here's the banana oil, right? You actually washed it with sodium carbonate. But if I'm not mistaken, there's also like sodium hydroxide somewhere in that reaction. And people will add the sodium hydroxide to their product to neutralize it. And guess what happens? It hydrolyzes, goes right back to the carboxylic acid. Goes straight to this. And then the alcohol goes back to the reactant. But again, it's real fast. Once you add it, you're kind of done. Uh, let's see, where are we at? Let's look at this. These are important esters, but we're going to talk a lot more about these at the end of the semesters. Yeah, but important esters are the are lipids. So, and I'm just going to I'll show you one other thing too, but. Uh, this is glycerol. So this is our glycerin. You, you hear about glycerin a lot. Like they put it in like skin products and stuff. And this is steric acid. So steric acid is 18 carbons long. So if you count like one, two, three, four, you get to 18 when you get to the end, right? So when you make an ester out of one of these, this is a, an esterification with one of these. You can actually fit three of these guys on here. And that, that becomes what's known as a triglyceride. So like when you do blood work, they talk about triglycerides or cell wall, uh, cell membranes and stuff like this. That's what this does. These would be triglycerides. So you had three of these. Turns out they, the, the carboxylic acid that gets used can be different. So this is like oleic acid. This is steric acid. Um, like you find a lot of oleic acid in vegetable, like corn oil and things like that. They're unsaturated, so they have higher, uh, uh, lower melting points. They're liquids at lower temperatures, right? Uh, and then, and then uh, one other thing about this is typically gotten from like animal products or plant products because they're cell wall constituents. And then we can hydrolyze them. That's how we get soap. Originally, how soap was made. So these these are the components of soap. Let's see what else is there. Yeah, you don't need to know that other one. All right. All right, carboxylic acids. Poor leaving group, right? Esterification is slow, so what do you do? Add a catalyst, right? A catalyst is usually just like sulfuric acid, like 10% sulfuric acid. It just protonates it and speeds the reaction, right? Um, it turns out uh, you can do acid catalysts, but you can't catalyze it with base. Um, because what happens is the carboxylate ion, once it does this, that negative charge can stabilize the positive charge here. So it stabilizes positive charge. And then the carbon's not electrophilic anymore. So once you put a negative charge on it, it can't act as an electrophile, so they're generally under. Right, so we can react them with alcohols. That's the only thing, really. And you can react, oh, sorry. You, this says you can't react them with the means. You can react them with the means, but you really have to force the reaction. So typically it's on a Bunsen burner. You get it like red hot and then it'll go. Yeah, it's not a common reaction. Um, uh, but the primary reason you can't do it with the means is because when you're trying to do a carboxylic acid reaction with the means, is... Uh, let's say it's ammonia, you'll end up with this. So it's not electrophilic, right? And then you end up with this. And there's no lone pairs available to be nucleophilic. So that just kind of stops the reaction altogether. Now, um, do I have the root final chloride? Oh, yeah, let's do this quickly. So in terms of reactivity, carboxylic acids, amides, and then uh, carboxylates, these are the least reactive and these are the most reactive. Um, I wouldn't say they're significantly that different, to be honest with you, but, but that's from your book. And then I want to do reactions of amides, and then we can move on to some other stuff. So amides, right, uh, unreactive with this whole list of things. But if you heat it with an acid, right, then you can form carboxylic acids out of it. But again, these are slow reactions. They'll need an acid catalyst. Um, Uh, you can use a base on these. 
I think there's a base catalyzed reaction for these. I'm not sure if I have it in here. Yeah, let me look at it later and then I think I have one somewhere. So this is the kind of reactions you can do. I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing mechanisms on these because they kind of all kind of fall in the same category. Is that? You have one. I have one later. Okay. So here, right, you can uh, add HCl. Again, you're going to end up protonating um, the octane. Something weird about this. Protonate the oxygen and then the oxygen is oxygen. Something seems wrong with that mechanism. Let me look at it. Yeah, you do have protonated first. Yeah. Yeah, and then the oxygen comes in attacks. You get a tetrahedral intermediate just like you did before. Then you have to deprotonate it. And then you have to protonate this so you can kick it off. Right? And once it's protonated, you end up with this, which then reacts with the ammonia to form ammonium ion and the product like that. So, yeah, anyways. So, uh, same, but exact same mechanism, right? Okay. Yeah. So, what is like uh, the base that you add right after this is going to be here? Um, so, you deprogram the oxygen. Yeah. The oxygen. And, and, and then, how did you get the yeah, here? Here. Oh, that, so, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, the, the question is, why didn't it protonate this, right? Yeah. Or a pro because in these mechanisms, <clears throat> we're always trying to do is go towards a product, and we all we know that they're all reversible. They all go forwards and they all go backwards. So what we do when we basically draw these is we try to draw them so that we're getting over to this side. In order to get to this side, you just have to say, well, then I need to protonate this. Now, why would this protonate versus this, right? The simple answer is nitrogen is a better base than oxygen, lower electronegativity, that kind of stuff. But, but the reality is like in a lots of these mechanisms, let me just make a note, better base. In a lot of these mechanisms, you don't have a good justification for why did you do that? Uh, because it's an equilibrium reaction, you have equal amounts of reactants and products. We did it just to go in the forward direction and get to the product. And then once we have it completed, then we can start talking about how do you make it go that way? Well, you know, in, if this was uh, not an, um, an ester, for example, the, the way we would make it go in the forward direction is by adding water and not adding alcohol. The way you get it to go backwards, that is protonate the other, is you add more of the product and you make it go this way. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, this is a little bit of that discussion. Yeah, and so you can do a hydroxide promoted, right? Nucleophilic attack, neutralize this. This is the hard part. This is not an easy step because NH2 minus is a very strong base. So, so a lot of times when people draw this mechanism, they actually draw another arrow of picking up the proton. Oh, okay. yes, right away. Yeah. Like this step doesn't make sense, but again, it's a slow reaction. So it's very slow. So, so this, this needs to get protonated, then it'll come out as NH3, right? So it actually picks up, like a lot of people will draw it like this. I don't necessarily like it, but I don't actually like. They'll do that and then they'll skip this whole step in here. And then you'll end up with an NH3. When you do this, you'll end up with NH3 and then the OH minus. Just because amide is such a strong base, you don't expect it to come off like that. But again, it's a slow reaction. You have to heat it and make it. Once you make it go, then this is a relatively stable ion. Oh, 
Okay, so um, one other, uh, I just drew the intermediate, but you don't need to know this intermediate. Uh, one very important reaction for amides, uh, not, well, this is the important reaction, but an important reaction of amides is this one. Is that you can form a nitrile and then you can make a primary amine. It turns out primary amines are not that simple to make. And this is just hydrogenation, like H2 plus a catalyst. Um, there is another reaction for amides that makes primary amines. Uh, and that one we haven't learned yet, but I'm going to tell you what it is anyways. It's, it's called lithium aluminum hydride. So that's its actual formula. And that will actually convert this directly over to an amine. Right, primary mean. So you'll get like this. It'll do a direct reduction reaction of the of the uh, um, amine amide. I'm gonna build a little note reduction. No, not for either one of these. I drew the intermediate if you want to try to figure it out. But, um. Yeah, so anyways, uh, P2O5, that's this actually. And reaction 85 degrees, and it will form this, and uh, I think water as well comes out of that. Oh, no, actually the oxygen just ends up with P2O5. Yeah, that's right, the oxygen just ends up with P2O5. So this is the P2O5 here, right here, without this oxygen. Um, let's see what else is there. Yeah. And then another important reaction of nitriles um, is, is this one. I think I've mentioned this one the other day. H2O and H plus and heat. And then you can form a carboxylic acid. Okay. Well, you know, it might be a general question like, well, why is that important? Um, if you start with an alkyl halide like this, but you need to make it into three carbons, You could react this with, for example, um, CN minus. Sorry, let me do it like this. And you can make like that. So you can do a SN2 reaction, substitute, right? and add a carbon and then form the carboxylic acid out of that. From that, you can form a lot of other different compounds. But again, there's a lot of versatility in nitriles that you can easily make them, um, like by SN2 reactions, but once you have them, you can convert them into carboxylic acid, you can convert them into primary means. Uh, if you have a carboxylic acid, right, you can convert it to a primary mean, which is one of the things that's hard to make. Through a reduction reaction. Hey, yeah. Underneath the P two O five, the eighty five degrees Celsius, consider uh, heat. Yeah. yeah, you have to heat it. Eighty five degrees is the temperature that is generally used, and I don't actually know what happens if you don't. If you, I'm pretty sure if you don't go to that temperature, it won't go forward. But I don't know what happens if you go a little bit above. I don't know if it just all decomposes. Uh, uh, yeah, you you only need to know this. Be nice if you can remember all those numbers, but honestly, I don't know that everyone remembers all the little. Uh, no, not this one. Yeah. We might do lithium aluminum hydride, but not of an amide. This this is pretty uh, 
this is pretty crazy reactive stuff. Like you throw it in water, it just goes. <laughs> it's it it is kind of fun actually, but it's a little bit dangerous. You're not supposed to, you're not supposed to do that. Yeah, we probably do. Okay. Um, the other thing that we use um, uh, that we can do is, is thionyl chloride, right? We use thionyl chloride to also to do the same reaction. That's a C. Oh, that was not there? Oh, maybe it's a hidden slide. It's before the dehydration. Oh, has this got switched in order? Oh, weird. I didn't don't remember doing that. Anyways, um, oh, yeah. yeah, the mechanism for this is kind of funky. I wanted to show you the start of it at least. Uh, oh, sorry. It's the first part is something like this. And you can kick off a CL group like that. And then this, so then you end up with uh, get it all drawn straight. Like that. And then what happens is this can come like this pair of electrons here. I kick and this positive charge here, it'll kick it up like that. And so then you end up, you can kind of see the direction it's going because you want to make a triple bond between the carbon and this carbon and that nitrogen. So you end up with this. Gosh, I haven't drawn this in a while. Ooh, didn't mean to do that. So you end up with that. All right. Why is negative charge? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking of chloride. It's gonna come off as a negative charge. And then the next step, if I remember it right, goes like this. <laughs> yeah. I think that's why I put the slide in here, just because it's cool. Remember, you get these five and six membered rings, right? And they're very fast reactions. And that gives you SO2, that gives you this. It actually gives you an HCl. So I don't know where the H went, but it'll give you an HCl. Cause you gotta get rid of those hydrogens. I should say this, 2H plus somewhere. I don't know where they went. And then, uh, so you're gonna end up with something that looks like this. Yeah, you got that. And then SO2. And then you have another CL in here. And that'll pick yeah, that up. CL. Yeah, that's that. That's where the other. I'm supposed to have another two H pluses over. I don't know where it went. Where's the other CL at? Uh, it came off here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it came off here. Very beginning. Oh, I've seen this actually drawn a couple of ways. And this is the way I remember it, anyways. I always thought so it was cool. I just like this step. In the CL, does it like evaporate or something? Uh, the HCL is a gas. It'll come off as a gas. The SO2 is a gas. It'll come off as a gas. So okay. one of the things that drives these kind of reactions forward is that the products, you know, Bay Le Chatelier's principle, you pull the product out, it just drives the reaction in the forward direction. It doesn't even have to be a more stable product. It's just the product disappears. Part of the product disappears. It goes in the forward direction. So it could be a CL or a CL two CLs and part of the ACL? Yeah, they're actually HCL, yeah. They evaporate out. Yeah. Oh, anyways, uh, this is actually very similar to, we did this reaction last semester, the same mechanism. But we did it with alcohols and carboxylic acids. We did it with alcohols. Uh, you can do the same reaction with carboxylic acids. 
Um, Are you not scared? Yeah. Why is that one called the dehydration? Oh, because uh, you're pulling out water and two hydrogens. <laughs> oh, that's what it is. Where's that's the, the huh? Where's the water? Is that the... Sorry. Uh, yeah, so it's not actually coming out as you're removing an oxygen and two hydrogens, right? So it looks like dehydration, but it's actually coming off like this. Yeah, so, um, hmm. I think I want to show you one thing before I show you this, I think. Uh, yeah, I want to show you one thing before I show you this. I don't know where to put it. Let's put it on the slide. So let's say you want to make a primary mean. Again, what I was saying earlier, primary means are one of those things that are hard to make in isolation. That is, like you want it to be your, your major product. And the reason for that is nitrogen is a good nucleophile, right? So let's say you have NH2, NH3, sorry, and an alkyl halide. And, and I'll just use methyl, methyl, um, methyl iodide. That's typically the one that people use with this. So I have that, right? So that's my reactants. And I have a lone pair. So it's SN2, kicks that guy off. And then I end up with NH3 plus CH3. And then the byproduct of that is just I minus. And we'll just ignore that for now. So it seems like, you know, primary, a mean would be relatively easy to make, but here's the problem. Um, it's in basic conditions. You can't avoid it because the amine is a base, right? And the ammonia in this case is a base. So what ends up happening, oops, what ends up happening is minus H plus, you get this. And it turns out, um, this is a better nucleophile than that is. And the reason it's a better nucleophile is because that carbon that's on there increases the electron density on the nitrogen. So it ends up being like better than the original molecule at being a nucleophile. So what it immediately does is it immediately attaches to the next available CH3I. Like this, kicks that guy off. And now all of a sudden you have a secondary mean, right? So you'll end up with an H, uh, two CH3, and then you added a CH3, it and just keeps on going. yeah, it just keeps going. It, like a radical keep on. it just keeps going and going and going. And in fact, it'll go until it becomes a quaternary amine. It'll, it'll be, then it'll stop because it'll all be filled up. It slows down, I think, if you get to the quaternary amine just because it's so big. But, but yeah, there's, there's no way to stop this reaction after the first addition from adding the second and the third and oftentimes the fourth. And there's ways you can play with concentrations to make it work, but people sort of basically said, well, we're not just going to do that because it's a big waste of energy and time. So they came up with this other synthesis, and this seems like it's not as easy, but it is actually more effective. And the guy Gabriel came up with this idea, and... And this, this really is how a lot of primary means get made, except for maybe the reductions of nitriles and things like that, okay? So they have this molecule, it's called thalamide, it's got nitrogen in it, and you treat it with uh, sodium hydroxide, and it becomes nucleophilic, so that's the first step. Second step is you add an alkyl halide, and it only adds once. You take this product, and you heat it and you do the hydrolysis. This is basically the hydrolysis of an amide twice. Okay. So thalamide has two nitrogen uh, carbonyl bonds here. You have to hydrolyze both of those reactions. And then when it comes off, it comes off as this ammonium ion, which is not nucleophilic, so it doesn't add a second time. So it's under acidic conditions, right? Ends up protonating this, which stops the reaction and then the last thing you do is you just hype, uh, you neutralize it and you end up with this as your product. Okay. But it, it's a way to get a primary mean that avoids this kind of multiple additions. Like this, this is again called the exhaustive methylation reaction.
Um, mechanism is not too not too bad. Oh, it's hydrolysis of nitriles. Let's see. What a hydrolysis of means? Hmm. Is it out of order? Yeah, I don't think it's there. All right. I'll see if it's somewhere later. But it was, yes, Gabriel synthesis of means one of those reactions you need to know. Any questions about it? Kind of follow it, it's mechanisms, they all follow the same pathways, right? So the, the enzyme that you the third? This guy? Yeah. yeah. So it just splits off? Yeah, so this is what happens, right? Hydrogen protonates that. Okay. So I'll, I'll draw out a little sequence in here. I'm not going to draw the whole thing because this is just the hydrolysis of an amide. And I think that was earlier. Actually, that was done earlier. Now that I think about it. I didn't like party it up for the Super Bowl or anything. Man, I'm tired today. Kind of Monday. It was a nice family oriented Super Bowl party. Okay, sorry. So I have NH2, like this. Or let's say, let's call it NR2 just for fun. So that's supposed to reflect this part, okay? First step, acid catalyst. First step is the protein. Oh, but it's about sides. Yeah, so then it happens to both sides, okay. one step at a time, yeah. Second step in the mechanism, you bring the water in. And then you're to your tetrahedral intermediate, right? Although you gotta protonate the nitrogen. So, because otherwise, right, because what you really wanna do at this point is you wanna, next step is you're gonna wanna break this block off. So you have to deprotonate this, and you have to protonate this, and then you kick it off. But when you do it, because it's part of a ring, it's still stuck on one end. So you gotta do it twice. So it's, it's a mite hydrolysis to try this. Again, you're gonna end up with something like this. Remember one of these R's of this R2 is attached to this other side, right? And then um, you have to deprotonate uh, whatever the base is, which is probably water, because that's the solvent for the reaction. There's a lot of it around. And to put that, okay, I'm gonna draw it to a clear spot on the slide. All right, note to myself in the future, add more space on the slides. A lot of times I just prefer to uh, Just leave it blank and then draw it all out by hand. But that can also be annoying. Uh, yeah, so you're here, right? I haven't kicked this off yet. So then again, you're still under the same reaction condition. So there's still like this in solution, right? So I have to protonate this before I can kick it off. So now H plus, whatever that happens to be, some sort of acid. Um, I'll end up with this. NR82H plus. And then either one of these oxygens can collapse and kick off the, the group, right? But, but you have to remember when it does that, one of these R's, which I consolidated as like, this is R2. One of these R's is actually this side. So you got to do the whole thing again to get it off. And then with the other side, we started with only one R? No, sorry. No, it's two. Oh, sorry. I was just, uh, yeah, you know what? That H should be another R, but let's pretend it's attached. But it's basically a mind hydrolysis. I have two R's here, all right? And I have to break this bond. Uh, one R is this and one R is that, actually. So where did I not kick off my H? Or maybe. Well, you know, I, that's that's correct. Here, when I kicked this off, I added a hydrogen to it. Yeah, that's correct. I didn't lose track of a hydrogen. I thought I did for a second. 
Yeah, lots of little little things and mechanisms. Yeah, yeah. You have to deprotonate it, and then you work on the other side to get the other side off. And you have two hydrogens, and when it comes off, and it has to be protonated, and that's why it ends up like this at the end. So this reaction, right, happens two times. Oh, okay. Like this reaction here happens two times to break this side and then to break I this side. That. Typo. What's it? I am I? Is it my typo? This? Oh no! Um, this is what that's called. Uh, I'm a mine. I mine instead of a mine. Yeah, it is what it is. So thal amide. It's this guy. That's what this guy's called. Test. Do you need to know the mechanism of this or just? Well, you need to know this one for sure. I, I, I might ask you like questions about it generally, but yeah, I mean, this is like, you know, this is like ridiculously long. So I don't usually ask. Now it could be like at the end when I say, oh, pick a mechanism and draw, like I give you three. Uh, so your, uh, this is the one, if you pick it, it's going to be a whole page of mechanism. You'll be like halfway through it and think to yourself, I should have picked the other one. Yeah. That's actually, you know, a, the, the thing that I do in there is I, I usually pick one that's harder and much longer. I pick one that is easier and I pick one sort of in between. And part of the thing I'm testing you on is like, which one do you pick, right? Do you pick the easiest one? I mean, you don't get extra points for it. But every step gets more points in it because you're just doing way fewer steps. If you do the one that's longer and harder, then I break it up into more points. So like you do one thing wrong, you like lose one point, so like three points. You do the easier when you use big chunks, you do the hard when you use little chunks, but it's harder. It's a lot more writing. Ah, I think I'm done. I thought I was gonna finish this, I'll just finish it on. Just a little bit more, a little bit, not that much, just a little bit. Wait, I don't have any other slides. Mine's in, mine in Jacker Hydraulics and Metros. Is that it? Yeah. So, I kind of thought that first pack would last two lectures, but it's good. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, that's that other pack. Where are my wayward children? All right, I'm going to stop the recording and then... <laughs>